All right, so it is officially the last day that you guys are going to be stuck with me before Kyle Kalinske gets back from his honeymoon with Crystal Ball. So, you know, with that being said, I mean, obviously I've had a lot of fun over the last couple of days. You guys have been incredible with the support that you've been giving to me and my channel and all of that. Link will be in the description if you wanna go check that out. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get into what I wanna talk about today. So the first thing that we got here was Marianne Williamson, the one of the only challengers to Joe Biden in the Democratic primary for 2024, going on Piers Morgan show and uh, educating him in a number of different ways. We'll just say that. Now, honestly, I don't know who watches Piers Morgan. I don't know how, you know, you've gotten yourself to the point where your brain is that rotted that you enjoy what this man has to say, but he's going to be conducting this interview and asking some pretty interesting questions here. And I think Marianne just absolutely killed it. So let's just go ahead and jump into this first one, which is basically what would you do on your first couple of days if you were to be elected to the presidency? So let's go ahead and jump into this real quick. What would be the first thing you'd do as president if you won? One of the first things I would do is uh, determine that there would be an audit for the Pentagon every cent, every cent that we spend there. I would cancel all contracts where the United States government has contracts with union-busting companies. I would deschedule marijuana from a Schedule One drug. I would bring together a group to have a very serious conversation about how we were going to uh, get to universal health care. And I would also use the marching rights that are part of the uh, Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, by which pharmaceutical companies are told that if you develop a drug with even one dollar of taxpayer money, which means most drugs in the United States, that the government has the right to lower those prices. I would bring together a group of leaders who are the experts on childhood, everything having to do with the neurophysiology of children, uh, neuropsychology, the, uh, the needs of children in terms of health, in terms of education, everything that it would take to have the greatest experts on childhood, because I want to develop a, a department of children and youth. I want a massive uh, transfer of resources into the uh, lives of children 10 years and younger. OK. I wanted to Listen, have this is all... Listen, I'm, I don't want to stop you, but I <coughs> don't want to run out of all time, but OK, that all sounds very laudable as a, as a... And you rattle them off. You've obviously thought about it a lot, which is good. What would you do, for example, as Commander-in-Chief if China invaded Taiwan? I mean, like, what? How is that the follow-up question? I mean, I guess maybe he's just got a list of questions and he's just bouncing between them. But like, you just asked her, what would she do? What would her basically her top priorities be if she won the presidency? And she gives you a fantastic list, right? We're going to audit the Pentagon. By the way, the Pentagon has failed five audits in a row. It's a nearly trillion dollar per year financial black hole for the American government that somehow never gets brought up when we're talking about fiscal responsibility or whatever the fuck, right? So she mentions that. She mentions universal health care. She's in favor of a, a single payer Medicare for all style program. Okay. She talks about legalizing marijuana. She talks about using marching rights that the federal government has in order to forcefully lower prescription drug costs for the American people. She talks about expanding child care within the United States. I mean, all of these different programs that she just listed that are each worthy in and of themselves of getting into an in-depth conversation about why that's needed, why other politicians like Joe Biden are, you know, corrupted in the sense that they don't support those policies because of the influences of Wall Street and their corporate donors. So many different things that you could get into there or even keep having conversations about her actual policy agenda and his immediate follow-up question or, or statement is to basically try to dodge away from all of that and say oh no no i don't mean to cut you off but like let's just talk about something completely unrelated to everything that you just said right and so he asked what would she do if china went in to uh, taiwan so let's go ahead and hear her response on this which honestly i think she again absolutely killed it on that's a very very difficult one that's a very very difficult one and hopefully hopefully if i'm the day I'm president, China will not have invaded Taiwan. I will certainly not poke the bear. I would certainly try to walk back any of this almost Cold War type of conversation that is happening too much but in what this if country they actually did it? between the United States. What if you were commander in chief and they literally, <clears throat> in, as many people think is highly likely in whoever is the next president in that term of office, if they did invade Taiwan? Uh, Joe Biden has said he yeah. would be there to help. Would you? What did you say that Joe Biden has said? He said that he would help the Taiwanese, if that happened. Well, there are different ways. 
there are different ways to help the Taiwanese, and I believe that we're trying to help them right now. And one of the ways that we're also trying to help the Taiwanese is to build better relationships with China so that we can be more on a road towards healthy collaboration, which we will need, not only economically, but in order to de uh, deal with the climate crisis in the years ahead. So let's right now work on where we are. Let's not poke the bear. Let's take the temperature down. Let's think in terms of, t of China, not as an enemy, but as a collaborator, hopefully someone that we can compete with in a healthy way. The top that's of what is, my attention now, is on. Well, I say it was a great respect, but people will say that's very naive, that we've just, you know, if you did that attitude with, say, Vladimir Putin, that's not going to stop him invading countries. And people look to America, for better or worse, as the global policeman, and if you want to run the country, you want to be the boss, you're going to face some very tough decisions about what you do when the bears actually go and do bad stuff. OK, I mean, again, listen to how he just frames sort of like geopolitics and his understanding of the, the role that the United States should place, should, should be around the world, right? He refers to us as the global policeman, for better or worse. I would argue it's unambiguously been, at least over the, you know, since World War II and post-World War II American history, it's been for the worse, okay? We're talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of different countries around the world that the United States, through our military forces, through our economic power, through covert forces like the CIA, has been meddling with other countries around the world, destabilizing democracies, as I just covered uh, yesterday with the Biden weapon sales, supporting autocracies, supporting dictators like Saudi Arabia and the apartheid state of Israel. I mean, it's obviously been for the worse. I mean, what about the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war? I mean, so many different examples that we could give of uh, just the absolute destruction that the U.S. empire has been responsible for in this role as being the global police. Okay, so you should really do more of an analysis in terms of why you think it's necessary for the United States to be in that position or what has the actual net benefit or loss been from the role that the United States has played in that. But his question is basically just like, you know, are you going to, I guess, militarily support Taiwan if China was to go into Taiwan? And he just doesn't even address the actual argument that Marianne was making there, which is basically just why are we treating this as if this is inevitable, as if this Cold War II electric boogaloo has to be the status quo where we are constantly ratcheting up tensions with China. I mean, there are tons of different elected Democrats and elected Republicans who would love to see us get into a military conflict with China directly. And that would be obviously an unmitigated disaster for the United States, for China, for the rest of the world. I mean, we are talking about a war that has been, that, that would be on a completely different scale than anything since World War II, okay? It's not as if it's just some sort of casual thing that like, oh, if we go to war with China in order to d defend Taiwan in that kind of a hypothetical, well, that would be an absolutely great thing. No, I mean, obviously not. That would be a catastrophe. We're talking about two global nuclear superpowers going head to head militarily with each other. I mean, he just talks about it so flippantly and just doesn't even address the argument of like, maybe we should be trying to ratchet down tensions and actually trying to work together in a, a uh, you know, in a, a progressive way with China in order to address some of the biggest issues facing the world and facing humanity, like climate change, as she gave an, as an example. So I think that's really more of the attitude that we do need to see from some of our elected elected officials so that we could try at least to prevent that kind of a situation from happening in the future. But he just doesn't even talk about that. He just says, oh, it's naive. What? Because Putin invaded Ukraine? I mean, that's it's a completely unrelated situation unless your view of the world is just that anybody who happens to be a geopolitical adversary to the United States is basically just like Hitler 2.0 and they're always just going to try to conquer the world or something like that. But she continues here. Thank you, Paris. I understand what the role of the commander in chief of the United States is. But there was nothing naive at all about what I just said about China. And the last thing I'm not naive about is uh, Vladimir Putin. Joe Biden has said he won't debate other Democrat candidates in the primary mm -hmm. season. Uh, many people think that's just cowardly. What's your view? Of course he should debate us. There are three candidates for this nomination. There is not an enthusiasm in this country, as you were mentioning earlier. There is not an enthusiasm for a Trump-Biden rematch. Mm -hmm. The majority of people have said that they wish the president would not run again. If the American people hear his agenda for the next four years, and they are here my agenda for the next four years, and the agenda of anyone else who is running, and they say, through their votes in a Democratic primary, Yes, I think Joe Biden is the best candidate to win in 2024 and the best leader for the next four years. Then God bless him, he should be the one. But the idea that the DNC and the Democratic elite establishment can just shoehorn him into the nomination is undemocratic, 
you, if you have a party, which we do, that likes to think of itself as a champion of democracy, we should not be so wary of democracy in our no, own complete, house. So it is important that the president debate me. I completely agree. Um, I, I suspect he's quite afraid of debating you, actually. Um, <clears throat> kind of an unexpectedly good take there from Piers Morgan on this. I mean, yeah, absolutely. He's a coward. And listen, the reason why all of the people in Joe Biden's circles don't want him to go head to head with Marianne Williamson or RFK or any other potential challenger who would throw their uh, hat in the ring is because they know he can't do it. He can't perform in that kind of a setting. We know about his mental decline. Okay, but what does it say about Joe Biden and, and the Democratic establishment's faith in Joe Biden when all they can muster is just smearing or disrespecting regarding any potential challengers and not even entertaining the idea of going head to head with them. I mean, how is Joe Biden supposed to go head to head with somebody like Donald Trump, okay, who is, you know, obviously still at full throttle. We just watched his town hall the other day on CNN, right? How is he supposed to go head to head with Donald Trump or uh, Ron DeSantis if he can't even go head to head with people within his own party who presumably he would have much more agreement with? I mean, obviously he's not cut out to go through an entire primary process. He's not cut out to go through the entirety of the next general election. And oh, by the way, he he has an even less popular than himself vice president, Kamala Harris, who's sitting in the wings. And Joe Biden, towards the end of his next term, assuming that he wins, would be like 86 years old at the end of it. OK, so people in their minds are going to view this as a situation where there could be a significant degree of likelihood that Kamala Harris would end up by default being the president if Joe Biden became incapacitated in one way or another. OK, that is something that's going to drag him down as well, because Kamala Harris, not that talented of a politician. So these are all things that Democrats if they actually cared about democracy, would be taking into consideration, which is the most ironic part about all of this, because their main selling point to their voters seems to be sort of like hanging this threat over their head that if you don't vote for Joe Biden again, this authoritarian fascist threat from Trump or DeSantis or Republicans generally, they're going to take over. So the main selling pitch, once again, is just, we are not Donald Trump. We are not as bad as Donald Trump, which may be true on a whole bunch of different issues, but that's not going to be good enough, right? Especially when you're demonstrating demonstrating to your base of supporters, especially young people who overwhelmingly dislike Joe Biden, the polling data, we've all seen it. It's been absolutely atrocious for Biden recently. Okay. What does it say to your base of supporters when you're just not even willing to have that conversation and just trying to force this guy down their throats? I mean, it's obviously a pathetic situation. I think once again, Marianne Williamson killed it in this interview. I wish that her polling data was doing a little bit better. I've seen her get as high as like close to 10%. I've seen some polls more recently where she's at like roughly like 5% or something like that. But I mean, good for her for going on whatever platform will have her. I mean, obviously getting her voice out there uh, more and more and more is just going to give people more of a perspective on what she actually stands for instead of these, you know, mainstream corporate media smears that are typically coming out about her. I just saw one recently where she was on Sean Hannity and as the uh, Vanguard boys, the Vanguard podcast guys, uh, Zach and Gavin pointed out through some screenshots, if you go and look at the comment section posted on Fox News from that Sean Hannity interview, the, the Fox News viewers were turning on Sean Hannity in favor of Marianne Williamson, saying that she came out the other side looking much more uh, reasonable and actually giving honest answers to some of the ridiculous questions that Sean Hannity was asking. So I think Marianne does have some similar overlap to Bernie Sanders in terms of her being appealing to a wide swath of of a working class base of supporters. So I think she needs to get more airtime. She needs to keep doing interviews like this. And hopefully, you know, over time, she can slowly build up a movement, a grassroots movement that could potentially give her at least some sort of a shot at actually challenging Joe Biden. But it's going to be borderline impossible if the Democratic Party, the so-called vanguard protectors of democracy in the United States, aren't even willing to participate in democracy within their own party. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop, and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.